Hello, thank you for joining us for today's webinar on designing for studio grade security. My name is Usman Shakil and I'm the worldwide tech lead for media and entertainment at AWS. So I've been working with uh, a lot of our customers both on the content production as well as content distribution space for quite a while. And what I've seen is over uh, the different years that there's been a trend for more and more adoption uh, towards the cloud. And that's not just because of um, the, the scalability, the high efficiency, and cost effectiveness um, value propositions that the cloud brings to the table, but it's also from a perspective of modernization of um, content-related workflows, as well as the advent of machine learning. So before we kind of get into uh, some of the details of these um, workflows, I want to uh, start talking about you know how the uh, the the initial kind of myths about the cloud existed, and um, some of uh, these myths, um, you know, what what was kind of done to that, and how do we evolve uh, from a customer um, perception perspective? So a lot of times we hear when we go in the field that you know cloud is a multi-tenant based environment, and because of that, it is inherently very very risky. Um, uh, in the cloud, um, there is no, uh, not a whole lot of visibility and control, and this is this really comes from, you know, some of our sort of say server huggers, if you will. Um, uh, the incident response in the is very hard uh, in the cloud. Uh, you know, again, it goes back to the number two above, where uh, there isn't a whole lot of visibility. So how do I get the incident response? In the cloud, I must choose between the central governance and control versus agility and mission ownership, as known as uh, shadow IT, if you will. So obviously that's true that cloud gives you a whole lot of feature set and kind of freedom in terms of what your developers or your uh, resources can do. But at the same time, it also provides you a lot of tool set with respect to governance. Um, cloud is only appropriate for less sensitive data. More sensitive data is safer on premises. So as you can see, you know, and I could relate to many different examples out there from uh, the type of workloads that customers are running today on top of the AWS cloud, from highly available mission critical type of uh, workloads to highly sensitive and critical data sets uh, to even customers that are in the federal government space, all using the same AWS platform for running uh, their mission critical applications. So when it comes to uh, the baseline security uh, requirements or security standards, I mean, AWS has worked with um, you know, uh, many different uh, industry uh, specific uh, audit um, or compliances out there. And there is a whole detailed discussion around that in the AWS um, uh, compliance uh, white paper, also the AWS security website. So I highly recommend uh, folks to kind of go take a look at it when it comes to content specifically, um, you know, the common security requirements are around the MPA, the Motion Pictures Association of Americas, that have uh, the best practices guidance for uh, storing content as well as uh, running content-related workflows. Uh, there is the CDSA, the Content and Delivery Security Alliance, um, and then uh, you know, on top of all of that, there is the major studio requirements, uh, for example, uh, Disney Marvel being um, considered as the gold standard. Um, the Most of these uh, requirements that you will see, or the baseline requirements, are usually um, based off of some specific um, uh, existing uh, uh, compliance, for example, uh, CSA, um, uh, there is the ISO, as well as SOC or NIST uh, specifically publish uh, the controls baseline. Um, and then there is the third party audits uh, on top of it, uh, right, that could be conducted uh, in order to uh, find out that this environment is actually in compliance with a specific um, that requirement. I want to talk about uh, a little bit about the Trusted Partner Network, which is uh, actually an initiative um, between the CDSA and the MPA, kind of combined together. Um, and the idea here is to kind of, um, you know, uh, align all these different uh, industry-specific um, best practices or guidance, um, uh, and, and come up with a a single uh, partner network so that. Um, you know, all the service providers in that space kind of adhere to those uh, best practices guidelines. So it's 
the cloud really more secure for high valued content? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely yes. And as I alluded to earlier, um, you know, the AWS platform is actually built not just for one single industry, rather uh, keeping into consideration all the different industries out there. And we have customers from all over the place, uh, very large enterprises to, you know, startups to somewhere in between, running all types of workloads uh, from um, asset management, um, you know, of whether that is media assets or some other high valued assets, uh, to running high performant, uh, performant uh, processing of their content or other uh, data sets, uh, as well as, you know, uh, basically workloads from all the different industry verticals out there that also include uh, the public sector or the federal government uh, that, that have very specific or stringent security requirements. But at the end of the day, the platform is the same. And what we at AWS do is uh, we work very closely uh, with our customers, being a very customer obsessed company, uh, we work very closely with our customers to gather those requirements that are needed for a specific uh, security audit requirement. And we, um, we iterate on those requirements to build additional feature set in our services. Um, and as a result, you see a platform which is um, really hardened in multiple different aspects. And uh, from the analyst perspective, you know, as uh, Gartner states here, um, the, this whole kind of uh, uh, ideology or idea about, um, you know, the, the security of the cloud is kind of really shifting uh, in, in the other direction where um, customers are really looking at uh, cloud security as, you know, being very serious and something that they themselves not being able to uh, produce in their own uh, on-premises infrastructures. So why is cloud more secure for you know the high valued asset? So as I mentioned before, platform built for all industry workloads. Um, but in addition to that, there is also a default set of best practices. You know, default set of best practices that I'll talk about in much more detail later in the presentation. But um, really, you know, from a perspective of how do you um, build applications and deploy applications, how do you use underlying storage infrastructure? Uh, you know, some of the things around. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about the, is the least privilege. Right, um, and what you will see in some of these uh, applications or some of these um, uh, things that you will use on the cloud-based environment is that um, they are automatically kind of built in uh, to the platform by default. So, like say, if you are building an S3 um, uh, bucket and you have your content sitting on the S3 bucket, um, you know, by default, the access is only to the owner unless you actually go in and provide um, access uh, to anyone else. And we'll talk about, you know, some of the additional defaults uh, that are there. In addition to these default best practices, there is also the modernized architectures. So, you know, things like serverless, microservices, or different deployment models and the visibility around it. Um, now that's a, a, a kind of like an, uh, you know, more like an, a revolutionary thing when it comes to uh, when you look at your application architecture, because oftentimes what you'll see is, um, you know, you will build an application and, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty monolithic type of an architecture. You could do lift and shift, but at the same time, it gives you the capability to kind of rethink your application uh, you know, from the beginning. And not just simply lift and shift, but to also performance optimize or security optimize your application. And some of these uh, modernized architectures like say serverless or microservices um, kind of move that architecture thinking from a monolithic, always running type of an environment to really a transactional on-demand based um, uh, uh, environment, right? So as an example uh, of the uh, supply chain, you know, you will, you know, you'll see that these modernized architectures would allow you to actually start the underlying infrastructure for each and every single task within your media supply chain. So that's just as an example where you can use serverless components 
And the benefit really that allows or that provides you is that, I mean, consider a 24 by seven, uh, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure running for months and sometimes over the years, there's so many different vulnerabilities, even if you are really up to speed with respect to patching and uh, upgrades. Whereas, um, you know, an, uh, an on-demand transactional infrastructure like serverless patterns is launched um, uh, on demand for a specific transaction and it starts up fresh without any uh, kind of vulnerabilities uh, that could be attached to it. So, you know, just those kind of models uh, could be very uh, attractive, uh, even from a security perspective. <clears throat> So um, what are some of these uh, best practices? As I mentioned before, a set of guidelines are based on uh, some of these industry standards, uh, right? and they consist of application security as well as the cloud security guidelines um, So, uh, or the shared responsibility model. So what the underlying cloud infrastructure offers or, uh, or takes care of from a security perspective and what the application developer or the application builder or the application owner rather will have to uh, take into consideration. Um, and some of these uh, best practices that I talk about, for example, the CDSA or MPAA, uh, they're not really an audit. Rather, uh, those are all um, assessments or inspection and are based on self-assessment. And there is infrastructure and application assessment attached to it. So uh, in this presentation today, we're going to focus on specifically two key workloads. Uh, one is the uh, uh, rendering or the burst rendering uh, in the cloud. And the second uh, use case for the workload we're gonna focus on is the asset management and archive uh, of your high-valued assets in the cloud. So first, kind of talking about the um, rendering, um, there are a few key requirements uh, for secure render. Uh, there's obviously the whole idea of access control, uh, the network connectivity and isolation, the data and content movement uh, between the different environments, if you will, uh, the underlying storage security of not just the uh, inputs, but let's say, can you actually write outputs of the render in the cloud? Um, then there is the security of the cloud-based render farm itself or the underlying nodes or virtual instances that you're running uh, in the cloud, uh, the encryption of the data or the assets that are moving between the nodes, uh, whether that is storage nodes or the processing nodes, uh, or between different environments, whether that is on-premises or the cloud, depending on if it is an all-in-cloud implementation or a burst uh, uh, render implementation, the monitoring and logging as well as automation, uh, and then finally, the license server implementation. So all of these are very important aspects uh, of um, that, that one needs to look into uh, when they consider uh, a secure rendering application. So this slide here um, talks about a very high level uh, sample architecture of how one would implement a, a, uh, a, a burst rendering type of an environment in the cloud. So on the right hand side, um, you'll see there is the on-premises infrastructure and in particular, let's say if there is an on-premises storage, um, you know, that could be composed of multiple different um, uh, kind of infrastructure choices there. And on the left-hand side, you have your AWS um, uh, environment. Um, you know, so one key aspect is that from your on-premises, you either have a direct connect or some kind of a VPN over the internet that you're connecting to your AWS environment. Um, and the very first aspect there is the data movement, right? So how do you kind of uh, bring the data from on-premises into the cloud. So that's a key component there. The um, So once the data is in the cloud, you can obviously use uh, leverage some uh, storage cache that you can build using these atomic components on AWS, whether that is EC2 and EBS or block store, et cetera, or some off-the-shelf product um, that is available via the AWS partner network. There is also the Elastic File Store that offers you um, the uh, a, a shared file system, a high performance shared file system that you can actually use your hydrate workers to kind of um, pre-hydrate. And then on top of that, you're actually building your render farm, uh, which uh, you know is composed of EC2 instances, whether that is uh, spot or on demand. Um, <clears throat> now, on the other hand, if you have your assets living in S3, you could have an on-premises cache as well, which is 
read by your on-premises uh, render farm uh, and so that's a true burst kind of a model but in this case uh, you can build actually a system which is really an extension of your on-premises uh, render farm your license server can either live in the cloud or on-premises depending on how you choose or where the majority of the infrastructure lives or what your licensing arrangement might be if you're using marketplace or if you're using uh, bring your own licenses and you're using your own kind of uh, licensing manager right but all these uh, different aspects are important that need to be considered from a security perspective so specifically the security of the underlying uh, ec2 instances or the block store um, that is attached to um, to that infrastructure so um, you know that is that is important you also want to uh, you know pay attention to uh, the underlying uh, a, a license uh, server for example right how that license server is actually interfacing with the underlying render nodes now in some cases some of the software vendors would require the capability to call back home now uh, very quickly what you will see is like how do you call back home do you actually poke a hole and go over the public internet to a license manager endpoint if not if it is on premises could that be over the vpn or even in the first scenario where you have to kind of traverse the internet can it be through a controlled uh, route which could be via on premises so how do you accomplish that um, the next aspect uh, or the second kind of use case that i want to talk about today is um, you know the the requirements around a secure asset management system so right how would you build um, what would be some of the key requirements around asset management systems? So for most part, you know, when we talk about the asset management system, there is actually the storage of the underlying assets, but at the same time, there is an entire workflow which um, kind of runs on top of the asset management system. So what you'll see is like from a workflow perspective, a lot of it is very similar to your render type of requirements because both have a lot of similarities in terms of a batch type of a workload, right? So all of those uh, will uh, be the same with respect to access control, with respect to net network connectivity and isolation of your nodes or your processing nodes. How do you move content and data back and forth the uh, security of your storage, uh, the encryption, etc., around it. Um, then the cloud-based asset management workflow security, that is uh, going to be key. I mean, although in the case of render farm, one would say that, you know, how do you manage the pipeline manager around it? So again, um, the, the workflow is kind of similar, but it's much more involved in the case of asset management. The encryption will be much more involved because you have multiple different storage tiers in this case. Um, how do you monitor, log, and automate the entire um, uh, workflow so that you uh, can monitor it and log it from a security perspective and automate some of the actions that are needed? Um, what is your messaging architecture? So if you're using a, sort of say a pub sub kind of a model to run your workflow over the asset management system, um, the content playback is another piece uh, because uh, you know unlike uh, uh, VFX rendering, uh, this is actually finished assets that your uh, users or your people that you provide access to would like to play back and see, uh, you know, before they do different tasks on them. Um, managed services, if you're using some of them, so like, you know, uh, we'll see there's a whole lot of services that are uh, now offered in the form of SaaS-based or PaaS-based models. Uh, AWS has its own uh, AWS media services that are offered. Um, you know, in a fully managed way where you can leverage those for uh, encoding, transcoding, live streaming, or packaging uh, type of capabilities. Um, so how do you manage those managed services, you know, in conjunction with some of these, uh, 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 these base level uh, infrastructure constructs like EC2 or S3? Uh, how do you pass the encryption capabilities around it? Um, then machine learning applications. In the case of supply chain, we were seeing a whole lot of uh, application or usage of machine learning uh, applications that are being used to actually um, uh, run the uh, uh, or, 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 or run different tasks that are required. So, for example, metadata extraction, facial recognition, translation, transcription of the content, etc. Some of the scenarios there. But again, how do some of these fully managed machine learning applications um, access your content? Right? If the content is encrypted, then how the key management occurs. Um, and so on and so forth. So those are some of these are some of the considerations or requirements, you know, when it comes to actually implementing a secure um, asset management system. 
So um, this is a high level architecture, uh, if you will, for an asset management system in the cloud. Um, and, uh, you know, starting from the left hand side, you have your asset management user and there are actually two different routes. Um, one is actually where uh, the, the kind of wider arrows uh, depict the movement of the content, whereas the, um, the smaller arrows uh, depict the actual workflow. So what we've tried to do in this case is, and this is just one small, one variation, if you will, of many different architectural patterns that can exist for an asset management system, because it could be a very complex process, um, the, the entire workflow, if you will. And there are a lot of off the shelf products available as well that offer this entire kind of uh, implementation in a box. So what we've done here is uh, it's a it's a sample architecture that is highly leveraging the entire serverless pattern. Um, so on the left hand side, the asset management um, user actually uh, can upload the video files, um, which is depicted through this uh, big arrow. Uh, they can leverage S3 transfer acceleration or AWS Direct Connect. Um, you know, S3 transfer acceleration could be over long distances, over public internet, VPN type of an interface. Uh, the files get into a content lake that could be S3 um, and uh, you know, have uh, some kind of a policy to kind of um, uh, move content or tier content into the different object storage tiers that AWS offers. But the key aspect there is that once the content arrives in the S3 uh, bucket, then that uh, can actually trigger a notification that can trigger the entire uh, workflow um, using, you know, a series of Lambda functions orchestrated through AWS step functions. So the idea being that, you know, it's all transactional so that you don't have any running infrastructure that is in your control in this uh, context and every single thing is on demand. So whether that is, uh, you know, running um, uh, AWS Elemental Media Convert to create proxies uh, that are then stored into S3 as well, or running, uh, you know, simple tasks like, um, you know, uh, uh, doing a universal ID assignment uh, or extracting our technical metadata or computing an MD5 hash sum or, or doing some complicated machine learning type of aspects, whether that is machine learning video or audio or text. Um, and all of that could be, uh, you know, really on demand and transactional orchestrated through Lambda. And the entire metadata could be all captured in a single unified uh, asset management uh, or in single unified metadata uh, repository, if you will, which by the way, you can also uh, add additional constructs. Like let's say if you have a, a, a data warehouse type of a model, then you can bring that data in as well and run heuristic um, on it. Um, but the entire metadata then available via a search interface using Amazon Cloud Search, um, which can then be exposed via uh, a Beanstalk uh, application that builds a front end uh, to this entire asset management system. So as you can see in this um, uh, architecture, the entire application from the front end to the back end of the asset management system and the entire workflow on top of it is actually built using serverless. Um, and it's all fully transactional, uh, meaning uh, you know it, it, the, the underlying infrastructure runs for the life of the processing of a particular asset or file. Now, in terms of the security, you know, there are several things that are very important here that we need to understand. So one is this entire path that the content takes uh, end to end, you know, from the receipt of the content all the way back to playback uh, or any other aspects, um, you know, also from a perspective of how this content is being used by different tasks of your asset management workflow uh, to storage. Um, uh, then we talk about the content lake itself. How do you secure this content lake itself? Um, we talk about the different uh, processing uh, nodes that are have, uh, different processing tasks that are happening and the security of the underlying workflow itself. So. Um, you know, what would be the implications with respect to um, sort of say vulnerabilities specific to this PubSub model or this uh, Lambda function, et cetera. The security of the underlying workflow tasks, um, you know, uh, in this specific scenario, we are highlighting media convert, uh, Amazon recognition, Amazon transcribe and Amazon comprehend, all of these being value added services to your asset management system. And then finally, the security of your 
uh, front end interface um, that includes your uh, identification or ID, um, that includes your metadata search, your metadata uh, repository capabilities, as well as uh, playback. So, um, you know, up till now, I discussed the architectural patterns for uh, VFX as well as asset management. Now, let's take a, a you know, uh, uh, kind of step forward towards how AWS can make it easier for you, uh, specifically from security feature set perspective or architectural patterns perspective, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually extract out some uh, architectural commonalities uh, across the two um, different use cases that I discussed, and I'm going to give you best practices uh, related to security. So the very first one is around governance and access control, right? So oftentimes what we see in um, these uh, media workflow settings is that there are multiple different par parties that are involved in a single workflow. So if you look at, say, your VFX rendering type of scenarios, um, you know, you could have a VFX studio that is actually a service provider to a content owner studio, right? Or there could be a post house uh, facility, uh, maybe even uh, a media manager kind of associated with it. So you have very quickly the makings of multiple entities. In the case of asset management systems, um, very uh, often you will see that there will be, again, multiple different parties from uh, content um, uh, the content providers or content suppliers, if you will, to um, uh, service providers that could act in the form of a, a software as a service or a platform as a service, or even uh, you know a one-off kind of a service which is being uh, uh, outsourced uh, to a service provider, and then finally you know the the recipient of the content. So very quickly you have this entire workflow like your media supply chain where you have uh, multiple different actors or organizations that are associated with it. So how do you really do uh, governance and access control? And, and also, more importantly, these when it comes to these third-party service providers, it is important uh, to understand how they do governance and access control because uh, at the end of the day, they are using the same environment in a multi-tenant fashion. So meaning one VFX studio could be doing multiple projects and those multiple projects could belong to different um, underlying content owners or studios. So, uh, you know, it, it, so that's where it's important, like how do you do governance and access control? So uh, the identity and access management and IAM roles is very, very important here, um, as well as the couple of uh, additional services like the AWS organization and AWS Cloud Directory. So um, identity and access management, as the name suggests, uh, is the capability that gives you, uh, that, that provides you the ability to create users, groups, and permissions. And then IAM roles is more of an automated kind of a function that allows you to do assumed permissions. So let's say if you have created a set of permissions for a set of uh, groups or, or users, um, then the underlying infrastructure that is running an application could be launched. For example, an EC2 instance that's running a transcode on a file could be launched with an IAM role that it can assume a permission to be able to read a piece of content um, without, um, say, an actual human being going in and providing that permission. So this is like a very robust kind of a capability that uh, provides you the ability to make this workflow uh, you know, uh, completely um, error prone. Now, from uh, AWS organization's perspective, that's actually the policy-based management of multiple AWS accounts. So oftentimes what you're going to see is um, the content, the underlying content owner actually requiring the uh, the service provider to have, to, to run their um, application or run their uh, processing or value-added function to their content in a totally isolated environment. Um, now, you know, it, it's it's kind of interesting if that, uh, you know, if we deep dive into it, that what does that isolated environment means? But oftentimes it is considered as uh, you know, having a separate account altogether from the underlying cloud vendor perspective. So AWS organizations actually makes it very, very easy um, for these service providers because it gives them the capability to create policy-based management um, and they can have multiple AWS accounts, you know, each for each content owner that they are providing the service to. And then they could have a master level account, which is which belongs to their own entity. Um, and all these other accounts kind of um, 
uh, role into this one big master account. So this provides them capability from uh, billing um, perspective uh, or the master payer account, etc. But also more importantly, from access control and governance perspective, some of the policies that they can set there. Um, AWS Cloud Directory is um, actually a multi-tenant directory based store. Uh, so again, it's a fully managed uh, service that's available to our customers. So here, um, I want to talk about um, you know a design pattern which um, uh, which allows our customers to actually do cross account access. So in this scenario, uh, kind of think of it as uh, you know if you are a content owner um, that is leveraging a, a pass or a SaaS which is running on top of AWS in their own separate account. How do you leverage that to actually uh, provide them access to your content, but also at the same time being able to um, uh, monitor uh, what's going on in that SaaS or PaaS on behalf of your uh, of your content, right? Or what's happening to your content? So having that visibility, if the third party PaaS or SaaS owner gives you that capability, so. Um, you know, specifically in this scenario, first of all, the studio uh, or the content owner creates a master key per title, um, and then the content is stored on the AWS object store, encrypted using KMS, our key management service. Um, that could be one key per title. And then um, the content owner actually creates an IAM role, uh, which uh, provides access to the content from their S3 bucket to this third party AWS account. Now the third party then uh, comes in, uh, and uh, you know they have launched their processing nodes in their VPC. Um, you know th these processing nodes, let's say in this scenario, could be an encoder form, um, and they can access the S3 bucket via the S3 VPC endpoint, and they can call KMS to get the encryption key. So bear in mind these instances that are launched on the right hand side, inside of this third party. Uh, service providers account are actually launched with a, a IAM role which uh, was provided by the actual content owner for them to be able to a, read the content but also being able to call KMS to get the encryption key. Um, now there could also be infrastructure or application services that are running on the uh, content owner's account and those could all uh, you know work together with this service provider over VPC peering. And um, you know, if again the third-party provider, this PaaS or SaaS, allows the content owner to um, uh, to 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 run CloudTrail or be able to view CloudTrail on their account, they can they can choose to do so as well uh, via uh, cross-account access. So you can obviously look at much more details on this kind of a pattern um, on this website that I've listed down here through AWS organizations. Um, so the next aspect or the next area is the network connectivity and isolation. Um, so AWS provides you AWS Direct Connect uh, and Direct Connect Gateway. So Direct Connect is a capability where you can actually peer, peer with AWS over a direct um, a line um, that could be in the multiples of one gig to 10 gig uh, direct connect. And the Direct Connect Gateway actually gives you the capability to go from one direct connect uh, in location or interconnect to any region in the world. So let's say if you peered uh, from one location down in LA, say one Wilshire in LA, uh, to our um, US West one region, uh, but now you have a remote team that is in uh, New York and they need to have access to it and you want to somehow um, you know, have access to their environment in the U.S. East one uh, region, you can actually use this one direct connect that you had put in place from one Wilshire to the uh, U.S. West one region to actually take you to U.S. East one region as well. So that is the underlying application of the direct connect gateway. So um, oftentimes what we've seen is, you know, in the case of burst type of scenarios where say you have an on-premises infrastructure that you're using to render and you want to scale out to multiple different AWS regions, you can actually use this one uh, direct connect to take you to multiple uh, regions uh, as well. 
to leverage the capacity across uh, the different regions. Um, AWS uh, VPC or Virtual Private Cloud uh, gives you the capability to create a, an isolated environment um, within the AWS cloud, which um, uh, again gives you the ability to define your own private address space. Uh, you can also choose to completely isolate it, meaning the only way to connect to your VPC could be through Direct Connect or a VPN gateway. Um, and we offer the cloud-based VPN as well. Um, each one of the EC2 instances that you launch in your subnets um, give you the EC2 security groups and network access control lists. Uh, so it's both stateful and stateless firewalls per instance or per virtual machine, if you will. Um, so the you know the the one of the key aspects we talked about earlier when we talked about the architectures was how is this data or content moving from on-premises into the cloud, both in the case of say the burst render as well as your asset management system, right? And in some cases, what you're going to see is it's uh, it could be over Direct Connect uh, because hey, it's your on-premises and you have the capability to spin up or create this Direct Connect link into AWS, and you could go over that. In many other cases, you're going to see that that's not a choice or that's not an option because you're using a service provider. Um, or that has multiple different locations across the world, um, or do, does not have a direct connect with AWS, or you have you're receiving content from many different suppliers. In the case of your asset management system, and um, you know it's uh, it's basically a one-to-many type of uh, transfer. So obviously there are means to kind of accomplish that over VPN. Um, and uh, you know AWS offers you the VPN gateway, but at the same time you can leverage direct connect. Um, you can actually encrypt your content uh, on premises and we'll talk about it in much more detail but basically encrypting content client side first um, then using um, HTTPS or TLS uh, connection over to the S3 endpoint um, you know for encryption in transit um, and then getting into uh, S3 and enabling uh, encryption uh, at rest as well. Now, this entire process, uh, you can also kind of automate uh, the access through identity and access management. Um, and, uh, you know, that covers the roles as well as the KMS access, et cetera. Um, for S3 access uh, to EBS or other processing layer, um, you can again launch that with the role, but at the same time, um, only allow uh, the movement of the content over the VPC, S3 VPC endpoint, so that your S3 endpoint is protected, meaning um, you can create a policy for your S3 uh, such that the only way to, to read or write anything to your S3 bucket is um, over a S3 VPN endpoint, right? And it's not over a public endpoint. And then finally, uh, we've also seen Snowball, uh, which is actually a physical appliance that uh, AWS can ship you um, uh, for uh, accelerating the transfer of very large scale assets uh, into the cloud. Um, so, you know, with respect to the instances itself, you know, we talked about um, the render nodes as well as the media processing instances that are running the underlying application. Um, there are some of the con uh, considerations that um, you need to uh, have in mind. So first of all, you know, looking at the hardened AMIs or Amazon machine images. So making sure that you're creating the, your golden images appropriately and there is a proper access control around it as to who can create those, what your underlying developers or your deployers have access to as to what AMIs they can actually launch instances of. of. And you can really automate all of that uh, through the, your IAM policies. The same thing uh, with CloudFormation, so that allows you to really automate each and every single thing within your deployment stack. Um, and, you know, so the idea here is that you look at your underlying architecture, take a step back, and then um, harden that architecture, but at the same time, once you have it finalized or, or fully vetted and approved, then you use CloudFormation to automate it and version control it, etc. You also have to look at the license server implementation, and I talked about it earlier, like how do the interaction from this license server to your render nodes occur? Because if your render nodes or your processing nodes are running inside of a VPC in a fully isolated environment, then that licensing server 
is important because if licensing server is talking over the public internet or you're talking, your render nodes are talking about a license server on premises, so these are the key considerations that you wanna have and do proper risk mitigation around it. Uh, a couple of different services that I want to talk about that are very useful here. One is the AWS Config and the AWS Systems Manager. So AWS Config actually uh, gives you the capability to assess, audit, and evaluate the configuration of your AWS resources. So as I mentioned before, you know you could use, uh, you have to uh, make sure that your armies are hardened, uh, hardened machine images, updates, patches, all of that good stuff. So you can actually create a rule set within Config that it will assess against and actually audit all of your running instances against. And it continuously monitors and records your AWS resource configurations and allows you to automate the evaluation of recorded configurations against desired configurations. And then it enables you to simplify compliance because at the end of the day, if you're going and uh, getting an audit done for your underlying application stack, uh, you know you could just simply provide them with the AWS config report that actually gives them a comprehensive view of what um, uh, underlying version of a software or OS uh, is running where. Um, the AWS Systems Manager is also a, uh, is a, is a very useful um, capability. Um, it's actually a unified interface for operational uh, data across multiple AWS services um, and also on premises. So just imagine if you have multiple VPCs, one running your Linux uh, um, you know, instances, but the other running a Windows stack or something else, or it could be multiple different applications. Um, right? um, could be render farm in one VPC and the other could be running some of your monitoring apps or your license server, etc. cetera. So uh, it gives you a unified view, uh, operational view, but at the same time, it also takes into, um, uh, you know, it, it basically scans your instances against your patch configuration and custom policies. Um, and it's also a centralized store to manage the configuration data. So some of the stuff around your database strings or passwords, uh, and it, it, it allows you to separate your, your secrets um, from uh, or data from code. Um, the other big piece around this is that it's not just for your AWS resources, but also your, um, your VMs that you're running on premises uh, in a hybrid environment. So it gives you a single pane of glass, if you will, across all your uh, different infrastructure that you're running in the context of an application. Um, with respect to the storage, and we will cover the S3 specific uh, security, um, you know, towards the end of this presentation. But um, you know, in general, when we talk about storage security, uh, there is the default storage security, right? That the S3 and object store. I talked about it earlier as well. That every single time you create a bucket or you're putting a an asset in the bucket, you know, it's owned by the owner or the creator of that. <coughs> and Unless you explicitly provide access to somebody, nobody has just access to it, right? And access control, the fine-grained access control around it. You can also encrypt your uh, EBS or block store uh, volumes uh, that are attached to your underlying uh, processing nodes. You can do enable encryption, default encryption at rest, uh, the transit encryption as well as a key management service and key architecture. So there are many different kind of uh, architectural patterns around uh, how do you design the key management architecture and that's really dependent on um, use case to use case scenarios, but we've seen, you know, uh, I would say use case to use case scenarios, but also at the same time, the asset classification. So what we've seen in some cases, customers actually implementing a separate master key uh, per title and then uh, you know using data keys to encrypt each and every single object that is related to that title or in some cases you know uh, having a single master key for um, per organization and then uh, using data keys for all the different aspects of a particular title. Now KMS uh, the key management service also gives you the capability to bring your own master keys um, and it can vend the data keys or encrypted data keys, but at the same time, it also offers you a, a key rotation uh, capability. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, and I touched on this a little bit earlier with respect to um, how do you um, access, say, an S3 uh, bucket or your content in S3. So again, uh, depending on the asset to asset or workload to workload scenario, 
um, we see different requirements where you know one can actually go and use the S3 public endpoint and access the underlying objects. But in the case of uh, very high valued pre-release content, for example, um, it is advisable to actually lock down your S3 bucket and leverage the S3 um, VPC endpoint. Um, and you can actually create a rule set um, where the only way to access content in your S3 bucket is through a specific, uh, 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 through a specific VPC uh, private subnet. So this is actually depicted on the bottom right hand side where um, you know the, the only way to access your S3 bucket, uh, even if you want to access it from your own premises, is over a VPN or a direct connect connection going through a specific subnet in the VPC and you can configure it all through IAM. The other aspect is this also gives you the capability to create isolation or uh, access control across multiple aspects of your application so you know you could have a bucket that is hosting your high valued assets and another bucket which is you know all your logs your monitoring data and all of that good stuff so obviously those are two different um, uh, you know asset or data classification and you want to create proper uh, setup for each one of them so ppc endpoint kind of gives you that capability to uh, create this fine-grained control as to how do you traverse a specific bucket and who has access to it and it can also allow you or enable you to kind of create certain level of monitoring notification and alarm or automation type of capabilities across different aspects of a bucket um, <clears throat> so uh, monitoring logging uh, auditing and automation is a key topic and this is where in my opinion, one of the biggest differentiators of why, you know, when we talked about is cloud more secure compared to your on-premises. So the, the number of sort of say feature set and the scale at which this feature set can be applied is, you know, is, is really impressive. And this is where, you know, cloud-based implementations really shine. So specifically things like CloudTrail that can actually log each and every single uh, API call or access or access attempt by anybody, um, you know, on any of your infrastructure, you know, it is being logged. Um, VPC flow logs is actually um, the, the log of each and every single packet in and out uh, of your virtual private cloud or your VPC network construct. Um, CloudWatch is a monitoring uh, for each one of your EC2 instances or any of your other AWS applications, uh, other AWS services that you're using with respect to uh, monitoring, with respect to performance, etc. But at the same time, it gives you an API which allows you to log your own custom logs on it. So let's say you have an application-based uh, logs that you want to dump on it. You can absolutely do that and then have a unified kind of an, uh, a dashboard. AWS Inspector allows you to kind of look at specific configurations with respect to all requirements or rule set with respect to specific audits. And then if you are or any of your uh, pieces of your application are kind of diverting from that, it gives you those notifications. Um, and we'll talk in more detail about Guard Duty and Macy. Um, so Guard Duty, first of all, it, it, uh, it's a managed uh, threat detection service um, and it continuously uh, monitors for malicious and unauthorized behavior across all the different aspects of your infrastructure, whether that is EC2 instances or your S3 buckets, etc. Um, unusual API calls or unusual uh, deploy un unauthorized deployments, for example. So let's say if your AWS account got hacked, God forbid, and you know somebody launched a bunch of EC2 instances to launch some kind of a DDoS attack or whatnot, you know, Guard Duty actually would detect that and notify you. And it also notifies uh, or detects potentially compromised instances. Um, uh, by the attacker. So in the uh, diagram here, what we are showing is actually guard duty, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, monitoring this, th this threat detection across all the different infrastructure services that you're using, and then uh, pushing all of that into Lambda that pushes it into an S3 bucket. Um, and then you can build a stack using Elasticsearch and Kibana that allows you to then, you know, have a real-time 
uh, um, uh, visibility into any kind of potential uh, compromises that you may be running into. So you can, you know, search by keywords. You can also create a regex type of, um, uh, you know, uh, scripts here that kind of notify you or automate to notify you. Uh, Amazon Macy is another service, um, <clears throat> security service that uses machine learning actually to automate, automatically, automatically discover, classify, and protect uh, sensitive data in AWS. So based on, um, you know, sort of say your uh, uh, access patterns for particular types of data, it, um, it, would re it could also recognize the sensitive data such as the PII or intellectual property. And it can provide you with dashboards and alerts that give you the visibility of how your data is being accessed. And it protects your data stored in S3 with support of additional um, data stores that are uh, coming later this year. Um, so <clears throat> the last topic I want to talk about in depth is the uh, S3 security specifically, right? Because this is the key element when we talk about asset management or archive, because the key aspect of it is how do you actually secure your content lake? So uh, there is ton of information out there on the S3 documentation page, um, you know that you can go read up on. There is a lot of different blogs, videos, etc. Over the years that have been created now, you know, with respect to the security best practices. I want to just you know uh, take some time here and highlight some of the the key um, kind of say features, if you will, and how um, they work uh, or how those could be leveraged uh, in the uh, context that we are talking about. So first of all. You know the, the the whole idea of least privilege. Um, you know you don't want to um, give access to anybody on any kind of a content unless it is absolutely necessary. So S3 gives you the capability to achieve that through three different uh, policies. Um, one is the identity and access management based policies, um, where you can create IAM policies on specific users groups or create permissions as to who can see what. Right. Um, so we talked about the IAM roles uh, earlier where your applications can interface with S3 uh, in a specific permission setting without having to interface with a human being. So, <clears throat> you know, very useful kind of capability there. A bucket policy is another one where you can set a specific policy at the bucket level. Um, you know, so then you can start um, kind of saying, um, you know, that a specific bucket is just uh, not gonna not going to be publicly readable and only the admin user group can set that bucket policy and now anybody else even by mistake cannot come in and you know uh, make your bucket uh, sort of say read accessible to the worldwide or the publicly um, and you can create uh, things like MFA um, uh, requirements around it. So, you know, you, anytime you kind of delete an object or want to change, uh, say, that bucket policy, you require uh, two-factor authentication um, uh, to be able to do that, right? So basically, it's not, um, some of these key things are not done uh, in error. And then there is access control list that also gives you an additional fine grain control within within S3. Again, I won't go into a whole lot of details here. There's a lot of literature around when to use what kind of a policy in what scenario, and I highly recommend um, you know folks kind of take a look at uh, the documentation around it. Um, then on the encryption side of things, you know, so first of all, encryption in transit. So, you know, there is HTTPS, TLS endpoints for S3 that one should always use. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you could also uh, encrypt the content uh, client side. So the uh, Java SDK for, um, for S3, AWS S3 offers you the client side uh, encryption capabilities where you can actually either leverage KMS or bring your own key to do client side encryption. Um, and then you, um, uh, put, you know, you, you, you send it over an encrypted uh, channel over to S3. Um, you can also enable the VPC S3 endpoint that we talked about earlier. So the only way to kind of uh, put stuff into S3 will be over direct connect via a VPC or over VPN via a VPC into S3. Um, <clears throat> that's obviously just optional. Then on server side encryption side, there's three different flavors that the uh, that S3 offers. One is the uh, SSE, uh, server side encryption on S3, where S3 will actually manage um, the data and the master encryption keys. Uh, so you just basically check a box and say, hey, enable server side encryption and everything is managed by S3. Um, the second option is the SSE, SSE 
uh, server-side encryption customer-based keys. In this case, the, the customer or the owner of the assets in the bucket actually manages the encryption keys. Um, so you can bring your own key, uh, and the way you do that is you enable SSEC, and uh, anytime you're putting an object into S3, you will actually provide an encryption key, and then anytime you're doing a get from S3, you will have to provide an encryption key uh, for that. Then there is the SSE KMS, uh, which is actually leveraging key management service um, to handle the keys, uh, the encryption keys for the uh, encryption of the assets that are stored, um, encryption of the assets uh, at rest that are stored on S3. Um, <clears throat> there you can uh, enable default encryption on S3 as well. So this is a new feature that was kind of launched um, where you can say by default, anything that lands on S3 is gonna have to be encrypted, whether it, you know, and it uses each one of these, uh, any one of these uh, server-side encryption uh, policies. Uh, bucket permission check in. Um, so, we, you know, you can check all of the, the bucket permissions um, in the S3 console. So, you know, uh, now you have full visibility and anytime you can go run a report or look at it and see, you know, what buckets have, what kind of permissions on them. And you can pay, you know, specific attention to the ones that have or hold your uh, high valued assets. Um, across region replication, so that's a feature that as that allows S3 to kind of replicate content from one S3 bucket to another S3 bucket across the region. Um, now there is support for KMS as well, so that you know you could actually have your your replication in an encrypted fashion. And then object encryption status via S3 inventory and support for KMS. So S3 inventory is actually a feature that allows you or, or uh, to run an inventory of all your assets in a single S3 bucket in a period of 24 hours. And um, you know it actually spits out a JSON file. And now in that, it will actually also give you the capability to see what is the encryption status of a specific object in that bucket, right? So if there are any issues, then you can go in and enable encryption on that specific object as well. Um, the inventory itself, um, the inventory report itself also supports KMS, so that inventory report could be encrypted. <clears throat> so um, let's talk about a scenario in which you can now use AWS config to monitor S3. So we covered AWS config a little bit earlier, but in this scenario, <clears throat> you know, you have say an S3 bucket as depicted in the right um, the hand side diagram. And then uh, inside of AWS config, you will point to that S3 um, a bucket and you will uh, create the, uh, the the check bucket compliance or the bucket compliance rule set, right? Uh, and it, what AWS uh, config will do is it'll actually keep on going uh, through it, uh, um, you know, um, on an ongoing basis and it will make sure that that bucket compliance is being met. So like you could uh, launch a, a permission which or launch a specific rule set which is S3 public write prohibited or public read prohibited. So anytime if somebody ever tries to by, you know, intentionally or unintentionally try to change that rule, config will catch it and then it will bubble it up through the CloudWatch logs that can actually trigger a Lambda function. And the Lambda function then just can simply go in and uh, you know, take away that access, but at the same time can also send you notification, etc. So kind of things like that, that allow you to not only <clears throat> notify, uh, you know, uh, on kind of like a, a near real time basis, but also at the same time automate and take action on behalf are very powerful. Um, the, um, the, the, the other thing I'm gonna talk about is this whole kind of idea around CloudTrail. And this is, you know, for most part, when people talk about CloudTrail, it is kind of uh, thought of as API specific uh, functions that are called on AWS services. So things like create bucket or delete bucket or, um, you know, list bucket type of operations. But actually, CloudTrail not only offers uh, bucket level uh, actions uh, or, or or logging or monitoring of bucket level uh, actions, but also on object level access, which is very, very powerful. So just imagine if somebody tries to do a get on a specific object and whether that get uh, is succeeds or fails, you know, it is being uh, logged. And so very quickly what you could do is, you know, you could come up with a pattern where it's, you know, in a particular bucket, 
um, you know, you just don't want anybody to be able to do direct gets uh, because it's a very uh, highly critical asset or set of assets that you have in this bucket. And so anytime there is a get object tag or get object itself or get object ACL or anything like that that is being called, whether that is successful or not, you at least get notified so you know that there is some kind of a vulnerability that exists. And at the same time, this gives you information around the source IP address of that request, the user agent, the access key used in that request, and then request ID and extended request ID. So it, it gives you that entire thing. Um, also a word on Amazon Athena, so that is our uh, service that allows you to uh, query um, uh, or, or write SQL-like queries against the data that is stored in S3.